Okay, I wish you a very good morning from Brussels. I said I would not do any uh, videos on, on quantum mechanics anymore. Um, but I have a last one actually because I managed to, um, to kind of solve uh, uh, an issue I had. I had, um, you know, I talked in my videos about um, you know, the need to model what an electron and a proton actually is. And um, that's part of uh, what's referred to as a, a Titte Bewegung um, interpretation, or something that Schrödinger came up with. Um, so it's not mainstream, um, but it uh, you know it has a nice uh, uh, pedigree, I would say. It's it's a local and and realist interpretation, I would say, rooted in um, you know the question really: what is a photon? What is an electron? What is a proton? Um, because electrons and protons have some size. Uh, they must have some um, some structure. Um, the um, the model really is quite simple. I had an uh, an electron model um, which um, which I presented here. You have the uh, it's a mass without mass model. Uh, we have uh, uh, the uh, uh, Einstein's energy mass equivalence relationship, uh, uh, and we have the Planck Einstein relationship. And that's sort of where you can imagine, um, you know, a charge, point-like charge, uh, not infinitesimally small. It's, uh, you know, another aspect of these realist things that are infinitesimally small that have zero size don't exist. So we assume that an electron consists of a, of a point-like charge in, chi uh, uh, in the electron that the whizzes around. It's, um, it's a very simple um, model where, uh, you know, a point-like charge goes round and round and round and that generates... Uh, the magnetic moment uh, that we measure, and um, and this model really is um, yeah is a very simple one and attracted um, some attention when I wrote it. Uh, the the way I write it here, um, if we have indeed sort of uh, you know E is mc square and E is uh, uh, h bar uh, the uh, Planck's quantum the reduced uh, uh, version of Planck's uh, um, quantum of action physical action. Uh, times a, a frequency, and we interpret that as an orbital frequency. You know, frequency goes round and round. It doesn't need to be linear. Uh, for photons, we have a linear um, frequency. Let me clean up because I'm already quite going fast. And talking about things I don't want to be uh, talking about in this video because I talked about it before. Um, we can um, write, you know, the orbital um, uh, velocity, the tangential velocity, as the product of the the, the radius. Uh, times that orbital uh, frequency, you know, and if you insert that, uh, you substitute the frequency by c divided by a, and um, you, um, uh, yeah, no, the, the mass is there, uh, but we can write this uh, a Compton radius formula also in terms of its energy, and then we have h is h bar times c divided by a energy which is probably a nicer way because I said these are mass without mass models. What do I mean with that? Um, it, it, it is something funny. Eh? If you think about the um, uh, Lorentz um, formulas eh? and the relativistic mass, is we, we start off with something that has zero mass. And, you know, if we start off with something that has a mass, uh, um, you know, it's the relativistic mass will increase and hit a limit at a, a C, mm, this is the relative velocity, B is uh, velocity divided by C. Um, but so, yeah, our, our model is a bit strange in the sense that we have a, 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 um, a zero mass a point like charge. So, it's a charge without any other properties except for a certain size, which explains the anomaly. And um, yeah, if we um, we think of it being in oscillation, that's what the Planck-Einstein relation tells us. Uh, uh, everything is motion, things don't, charge can't sit uh, still. Um, then, uh, yeah, it, it gets an effective mass, uh, which is equal to the uh, electron mass divided by K. For a proton, it's, it's um, a proton, the point-like charge inside a proton has a uh, much larger effective mass. And that's what we want to be talking about here, the proton uh, model that we have derived. Let me clean up my sheet. Yeah, there we are. Um, for a proton, I should have written it out a little bit bigger. Um, we have indeed that um, uh, Einstein's mass energy equation. We have, um, you know, because uh, as you can see for an electron, we think of a two-dimensional oscillation in a plane. Um, the, the thing is, the um, 
formulas uh, or, or the experimentally measured values for the magnetic moment and uh, the Proton uh, radius got measured. Uh, it, its root means square uh, charge radius. Um, the formulas sort of indicate to, to derive a theoretical radius that corresponds with the experimentally measured radius. And I, I needed a factor of four and I didn't know um, where to put it and in the end I put it here. And you will say, oh, this factor of four, what is it? Um, well, you know, this factor of four is something that pops up when you go from 2D to uh, 3D motion um, in, an, in a number of formulas. So I thought like, okay, maybe the proton is uh, not a, um, an oscillation in a plane, but an oscillation in three dimension, like, uh, you know, a charge that um, goes around on the, on, the, on the surface of a sphere. I, in that case, um, you know, not right just simply C, uh, uh, the velocity, uh, uh, or the speed uh, is uh, a times v. We we need to write it as a vector. Uh, so we have a tangential velocity vector c. Um, we have a radius vector a, and we have an angular velocity vector omega. And we have a, a vector cross product because the magnitude of uh, um, our um, um, tangential velocity vector. Will um, will depend on the uh, on the angle uh, between uh, these two. Now that angle between the these two, and now I go to the model because I've been talking too much, and I really want to keep this very very short. Um, still only my solution is. Um, let me see here. Why I don't want to show. It's about time going in one direction. Yeah, we have a situation like this where. Um, well, let me show my animation. Um, I can put that one out. And uh, so you see here we, we have this um, <coughs> really weird motion. Eh? It's just one of the um, um, possible trajectories of a, um, a point uh, uh, on, on, a, on an orbital, uh, in an orbit on the surface of, of a sphere that we can show, as you can show, this animation is from, from Desmos. Uh, I really, uh, it's a free online tool. Great for uh, STEM education and all that, I really love it. As you can see, when it goes through sort of the, uh, the North Pole, I would say, which is pointed towards us, uh, this, this, um, this point-like uh, thing, uh, uh, imagine it as the tip of a wing charge, even the rotates around its own um, axis. So um, this is what I want to show, and I'm going to show you how I get this motion and why I now think that this might be the um, Zitterbewegung motion of the uh, Zitterbewegung charge in a proton. Uh, let me first um, uh, explain some more. Um, you can see here, let me rotate this thing. Uh, it goes around um, the whole sphere, huh? so from the North Pole to the South Pole in, in, a, in a very weird, strange trajectory, you might think. Um, this is called the Lisa Zhu uh, trajectory. You can read more about that uh, here. I have the Wikipedia article, I think, but I didn't pull it up. Um, but you can, you can see it. The Lisa Zhu trajectory uh, always involves, you know, uh, one, well, two frequencies, basically. But if these two frequencies are the same, and that's what I'm going to talk about, then you have a, a, a closed curve and a repetitive uh, pattern. Otherwise, you have what you probably played in, um, you know, uh, yeah, patterns that are not repetitive, that change uh, all the time in, in well, in time. Um, let me, so, so that's the, um, um, that's after a lot of thinking that I thought like, uh, yeah, that, that, um, that works. Uh, this is a, a trajectory that repeats itself. It has a certain uh, frequency uh, of repetition. And um, of course, I would need to show that this generates the, um, you know, if this would be point be a point like charge, like an electron, that this uh, generates um, the magnetic moment of a proton. Uh, I haven't done that yet, but I will show you there's a, there's a, there's a square root factor. You know, if it would be a pure circular orbit, um, you know, the magnetic moment, uh, theoretical magnetic moment of a proton would, would, uh, um, would be much larger than the experimentally measured one. Here we can see that, um, that I'm going to show, uh, maybe here, let me um, um, move it a bit faster, perhaps by, let's do that, yeah, by increasing the frequency. Yeah, you can see it's, um, oh no, you cannot see it. You can see it like this. Yeah. Um, 
from this side, the magnetic moment will be rather weird, um, but from this side, or let's see which side, you can see it will make two rotations. Yeah, you can see here it rotates in the same direction. Let me stop that thing. Um, stop it. Um, yeah, this will generate some magnetic moment, and you can clearly see the um, the it goes around two times in in um, in, in one uh, loop. Um, that that could, if that is a charge, that will generate some some magnetic moment. The problem I had really was that uh, you know to think about um, you know how how do you model this trajectory? It's like um, you know, I will show that uh, in my um, papers. I think this one here, uh, you know, I did these derivations. You can look at it. Uh, um, so these are these formulas that I showed already. This factor four. Uh, and here, really, I related to all these, um, um, you know, I insert uh, the, the values, the physical values, yeah, what charge, uh, so many coulombs, speed of light, h Planck quantum of action, um, and then sort of here I calculate the magnetic moment based on the formula, it's the current, uh, because this rotating charge generates a current times the surface <coughs> area of the um, the ring current. And um, yeah, if you, if you go through this paper, I, I realize, well, it can't be really a, a pure... Um, uh, flat uh, ring current in a plane because with the magnetic moment, where do I have it? I noticed I needed, um, you know, it didn't work out. I, I needed a, a square root factor. I was missing a square root of two, uh, a factor that I inserted. And that's what, what put me to think like, um, yeah, this charge does not only go round and round, it also goes uh, up and down well, or, or sideways, depending on the direction you are, you are looking. Um, and that's sort of where I, um, yeah, I arrived at this model, but the problem was really, and I'm going to show that in my paper here, the other one, uh, no, not this one, uh, pa -pa. Uh, where's my mystic paper? Oh, I don't have it here. Uh, 103, uh, but I had a mystery paper 102, which is quite, um, let me Google it. for the break also while talking. Um, a paper where I've thought about these trajectories. So if it goes around on a sphere, uh, what, what are these possible um, uh, trajectories? I called it the proton yarn bull puzzle. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, why is it important? You would say you have a model, you know, it explains everything and whatever. It's thinking of Dirac. Huh? And Dirac said basically if you have a model for an electron, you know, you have this wave equation for the motion of an electron. He said it's all about the equations of motion. And as long as you don't have these equations of motion uh, for your charge or for your electron, um, this is something I will show, then, uh, you, then you have nothing. And um, so I thought about that. And uh, to be sure, there, there are proton models around that talk about these. Um, this is a model of, um, uh, yeah, two, two researchers, real researchers, I'm just an amateur, but two scientists I greatly admire. They have a, a Tittebaweying proton model, um, which, uh, which builds on this, uh, you know, idea of a Tittebaweying charge, but it involves like two frequencies. It's a toroidal model. Uh, model. Um, so there's like a frequency for the... Um, um, for the combination, for the, for the, for the, um, yeah, the oscillation about this, um, I would say the circumference of the, of the, of the toroidal uh, thing as a whole, and then, um, you know, the, the, the charge moving around this toroidal shape. And I thought like, you know, my model has just one frequency. So this model, um, it's great, and eh? they derive the, uh, it generates the magnetic moment, you know, it's okay with, with everything, with all the experimental, but I thought maybe it's possible to develop uh, another shape. Eh? And so um, that's what I got to do now. I thought something like this and that sort of a, a, a spherical uh, accordion, and eh? the charge goes in and out, uh, moves from one extreme to the other. And um, 
you know, but this model didn't work really well because, uh, you know, if you think about an oscillation in three dimensions, then, um, you know, it should pick up speed near the center and then, you know, this, I mean, there's a lot of, you, you, you can read these people. The, this, this model didn't work very well. Um, so I experimented with other stuff and uh, it left me very, very, very dis dis dissatisfied. Um, you can go in this paper. You get all kinds of weird trajectories and in the end, uh, this is in the end the one that started inspiring me. It's like, um, yeah, if we don't think of a sphere, perhaps it's sort of more like a hyperbolic uh, uh, shape and an accordion, then, then you, um, you get a Lissajous curve. And that's what I'm having uh, here. This um, this trajectory, and um, uh, I said I provide the link in uh, on on my on my blog post um, uh, about it when I'm reading finally. You can look at. So how does it work? Uh, you can see here in the corner, um, I've put these uh, e equations because um, yeah, that's sort of the, the basics. So we have this um, I said tangential ve velocity uh, uh, on the sphere, well on the on the sphere, kind of hard to draw. Um, but so there's a tangential velocity, uh, uh, tangential to the to the sphere of um, on which this point lag charge. There's an angular velocity, uh, uh, w, and we have that equation that we already wrote. The tangential velocity is related to the um, uh, tangential to, to the um, um, uh, frequency vector, the angular um, frequency vector by this uh, formula, angular velocity. Um, so, um, yeah, that works all right, but the problem is, uh, you know, I didn't put any uh, restrictions on it, and so, um, you know, you will want to break this down in terms of what is called a spherical uh, coordinate system. Uh, we have um, a radius, yeah, A, R, uh, and then we have the polar angle. This is the polar angle, sorry, and this is the uh, azimuthal angle. And so the idea was, you know, how do I project, uh, because if, if I don't put anything, how does this... Uh, magnitude and direction of this um, uh, angular velocity vector uh, or the angular frequency vector um, relate to um, the r and the uh, and uh, and the polar and azimuthal angle. So the the, the things that you use in a um, yeah in a spherical spherical coordinate system, which is again which I will show here. Um, uh, the issue really. So spherical coordinates are written in terms of rho uh, and distance from the center, and then you have the two uh, angles, the polar and the azimuthal angle, and uh, that's what, um, you know, I put the rho here to one, it's a unit sphere, uh, that's the gray thing, uh, which um, is translucent, and then I have uh, the, the, the same thing here, you will see that, the red ball, uh, I can add another ball, um, but that obeys uh, and that ensures that these two charges are, yeah, do skate or, or move around the, the sphere because the first coordinate is indeed the product of a sine and a cosine and the y coordinate is the product of a sine and a sine and the z coordinate is a cosine of what? Of that um, azimuthal and polar angle, uh, depending on the terms. Uh, I let it, I let you look at this a little bit. Oh, maybe I can make it bigger so you can see it. Here, yeah. So you look at this basically, okay? And then the problem really was, um, you know, how um, do these, uh, you know, I have two angles. And so because it moves, I need to make these two angles a function of the time t. And uh, yeah, that's easy to do. Uh, it will be a frequency uh, times uh, t, angular frequency times uh, t. And uh, because these are two different angles, but I only have one frequency, here I write it as, you know, one frequency, uh, w times t. And I use w times t for both the polar and azimuthal angle, and that's why it stays on the surface. Um, I will show you something else here where I said like, okay, if we distinguish between um, the polar and azimuthal angle and sort of allow for two very different frequencies, two frequencies, then I have this weird thing um, here, um, which you also can look at in various direction. Um, but the problem is these, um, uh, they don't stay on the surface and their trajectories are not regularly, they bond these, these, uh, these little balls um, bound sort of in every direction. And as you can see, I, um, I first formulated the azimuthal um, 
angle in terms of uh, said maybe the polar and uh, azimuthal frequency so to say uh, have to add up to a constant to one so um, w square plus uh, the square root of one minus w square that will always add up to one it's like cosinus square that's what i put here and i let uh, then uh, w vary between zero and one i can use various functions for that but here i use the square root of a, of a cosine squared uh, to make sure that we have like a smooth um, uh, up and down um, for for the value of w and so that doesn't work um, it doesn't uh, you know your charge doesn't stay on the surface um, I said yeah maybe there's a ratio between uh, the angular and sorry the polar and the azimuthal um, angular frequency maybe that uh, w1 or w2 or whatever you want to call it if you multiply them they add up to a constant uh, that's the green ball uh, doesn't work either or maybe the sum of both of these frequencies has to be a constant that's the purple ball uh, it doesn't work either and um, and so that's where i ended with uh, it's kind of weird huh? this is a yin yang uh, trajectory uh, I can sort of intuitively feel this generates a, um, a, a square root factor, but how do I do it? Let me move on to my uh, calculation and then you will see um, um, why I'm so happy and why I'm doing this presentation to sort of uh, share uh, the updates I did to the papers because uh, that's really what I did. So we think about these uh, spherical uh, trajectories. Uh, again, here I write, uh, what is this purple? x y and z in terms of uh, you know the spherical coordinates uh, a distance r uh, from the central uh, center a polar angle and an azimuthal angle and so i have to can do that for x y and z conversely of course uh, we can uh, go to this spherical coordinate system uh, write a point p on a sphere in terms of the x coordinates hmm? the r will be uh, yeah that's the euclidean distance function for a 3d vector uh, so you take the coordinates x y and z uh, you square them you add them and you take the square root um i've not done the derivation well but it should be easily geometrically if you if you draw it um for the polar angle we have the the two argument arc tangent function as it's called a tan two uh, two arguments because we have y and x as the simple quadrant uh, um, that's important um, and then we have for the azimuthal angle also an arc uh, an inverse uh, uh, sinusoidal function the arc cosinus of a ratio z divided by r why is this so this is the geometry so based on that and i have the reference here um, uh, you can find it on more pages, but I like this one. It's very clear. A certain Matthew West from Thinking Engineering uh, Department of the Illinois University, judging from the reference DynRef at Engineer Illinois EDU, rds.hd. Now it was written in 2005. Uh, the nice thing is about he says, well, uh, you know, we have two sets of basis vectors now. We can write a point P on a sphere in terms of R and uh, uh, the two. Um, the polar and azimuthal angle or we can write a point in terms of classical xyz coordinates by using um you know the basis vectors that are associated with your cartesian uh, coordinate frame which happen to be um well it depends on how you compute uh, quaternion logic and all that but i j and k as um as orthogonal basis vectors representing the x y and z axis respectively so um, that's all good. And then on that website, and that's the, the thing I sort of stayed away from, is, um, well, the angular velocity of the spherical uh, basis, huh? uh, space, basis, uh, you can write it as uh, like this, mm, and that's the derivation I didn't do, but I will do the next one, uh, is, um, you know, the, the time uh, derivative with regard to time of uh, the uh, azimuthal angle, the derivative uh, with regard to time of the polar angle, and then we have these two basis vectors, but they're not, um, you know, they come from different uh, coordinate systems. One is the uh, base vector uh, with regard to the polar angle, uh, if we write uh, the base vectors like this, and the other one is uh, uh, the second base vector, uh, if we write uh, the coordinates in, um, terms of classical Cartesian uh, coordinates.
So um, that's not what we want because it mixes apples and pears uh, or apples and oranges as they say. So we want to um, uh, write this out. Uh, uh, we uh, we do that here. Yeah, uh, we want to all write it out, and um, we we first start by developing this one. Uh, well, I haven't done derivation, but this one here, um, you know, turns out you can write this uh, like this. Um, again, a time derivative here, and uh, I should check this one because that doesn't. Ah, yeah, yeah, we expand the k here. Okay, um, yes, because there's a formula for this basis vector k. So, but that's sort of what we uh, what we get. Let me clean it up. Um, this term becomes two terms, and this term, uh, when we expand, write this one in terms of er and the polar angle, we get this. So here we have a very classical uh, uh, representation of a vector v. It can be any vector in terms of, uh, you know, some coordinate, uh, some number. This is sorry. Uh, this is a number. This is a number, and these are um, base vectors. So that's the classical um, representation of a three D vector in terms of um, you know three coordinates. You know x, y, z, and three base vectors. So that's the thing um, where I was wondering, like, you know, I cannot assume um, that uh, for my function, uh, for, uh, as I said, my angle, polar angle is going to be a function of time. Mm -hmm. And um, my azimuthal angle is also going to be a function of time, uh, uh, which creates the motion. So I should have uh, a separate one for this and But that makes it very complicated because I told you, how do I break down this one frequency I have, hmm, which I derive from the constant speed of light and then a constant uh, uh, distance from the center because this point charge has to move on a spherical surface. So, um, yeah, how do I do that? As I showed you, my animation um, suggests it's all right. Uh, these two balls... Uh, can take one only, but I will uh, come back to that. It's sort of, I uh, mean, but that's just an impression on, you know, playing with decimals is uh, it seems to move with a, with a fairly constant velocity, but is that velocity constant? Tangential velocity has to be constant in my model, uh, for my proton model. And, um, and yeah, the frequency also seems all right. And both are related. It's a special trajectory with a constant um, tangential uh, velocity and a constant orbital frequency, but that's just, you know, an impression uh, based on this, um, um, you know, animation that I made. So we need to go um, and, um, where am I in my bamboo book here? Yeah, so uh, I said it gives, uh, it gives this, uh, um, I implement it, gives us a nice, uh, what I call a Lisa Jude trajectory, and uh, you can look it up, uh, and, my, and so that this Desmos 3D looks all right, but does it really come with a constant um, angular velocity? Just immediately say this is the angular velocity of the spherical basis, but you know if you take uh, a larger sphere, uh, then we just have to multiply with r. So uh, if I can prove that the angular velocity uh, for the spherical basis um, uh, uh, remains constant, then, then I am fine. So, uh, well, I need to write this out. And uh, you will say, oof, uh, that's what I thought, actually, intuitively. That's not simple. <coughs> and I thought uh, maybe I need some help here. And I actually talked to ChatGPT. He um, couldn't help me. But it suggests you just, just um, play, uh, write it out. And I'm grateful um, ChatGPT said that encouragingly. Um, so the first thing is obviously easy. The time derivative uh, with regard to the uh, azimuthal angle. Uh, if we have this function, mm, delta dt is, of course, this that is. And the same goes for um, polar angle. So already, yeah, that, that that's fine. That's great. Huh? So these ones and this one and this one is a constant. But I still have this cosine that varies with time. So, uh, yeah, what about the other factors? Uh, and then I was thinking, like, okay, um, 
I can't really directly relate in my cosmos um, here and my sign here to you know these functions inside. What do I do? And um, yeah, this morning I woke up and I said, "Oh, this should be simple." I forgot about you know this um, very simple um, thing that any vector, its magnitude, and that's what we want to find here. Uh, its magnitude is going to be equal to the square root uh, of the uh, squares of its coordinates um, added together. So we just need to apply that. My a is uh, is uh, this thing here. Uh, so I have uh, the square is I said this thing makes for uh, omega square. I have a cosine square. B is uh, this thing here, so I just have W square and then cos C square. C square is this is sine square. Now what you will see, of course, and I'm really angry at myself that I didn't think of it as much earlier, is that uh, yeah, if we then write the square uh, root uh, of uh, these terms, then uh, we get this, and we know that this thing here, the sum of a squared cosine, and a sum uh, squared sine uh, that's equal to one. Uh, or that's the definition of um, of a circle. So I do get this. Um, the magnitude of my angular velocity vector is um, the square root of two, hmm? because uh, here we have two. One plus one is two, and um, the square root of uh, omega squared is uh, is omega. So I have proved that uh, this angular velocity is constant, and so I have a nice total model. Now, there's a lot of work that remains to be done. I said I need to relate this to um, you know, what I calculated here. Um, now here, yeah. Um, but I, uh, yeah, I cannot write on this thing here, but you can see it move here. We were missing a square root factor, and of course this is a square root factor uh, in the, um, magnetic moment uh, so I need to check it in with the radius formula but I think it's going to work out all right and um, I will actually gladly leave that to others to to check um, because I'm I'm honestly <laughs> tired of quantum mechanics um, it's it's uh, it's a, it's a headache so I'm uh, I'm done with my presentation I'm gonna see where we are we're at half an hour uh, which is great. So, uh, but I'm not going to stop because I want to, you know, really conclude. And this is really my last video on um, these, uh, well, what I would call a local uh, a realist interpretation of, of quantum mechanics, uh, uh, electron models, proton models, by pointing out what I I did not do uh, in in all sort of these um, uh, sixty plus uh, seventy papers. Uh, more than a hundred papers, if you combine it with what I published previously on academia, and uh, and Vixra, I've been busy with this for for many 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 years. Um, what's what's left actually? Because um, you know, at the end, uh, it's about a year ago when I wanted to stop the first time. Uh, I published these uh, mystery papers. Maybe I can pull one up. And th this was the one, uh, the proton yarn ball puzzle which I say, you know, I have a nice proton model and uh, I should be happy because other scientists, you know, they uh, they came up with um, a perfect model, but I don't like it because there's two frequencies there and I only have one frequency out of my theoretical model also. Um, there's something with the velocity of the charge. I want a really a pure mass without mass model. Uh, my point like charge needs to travel at the speed of light around the um, uh, sphere that is given by the radius of the proton which 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 my thing does now so that uh, mystery paper is uh, is closed so i close it um i'm gonna close that too this is um yeah the calculation i'm gonna close that too close that too close, close that too yeah but what what is left and this is where i'm gonna talk about it but let me um let me do it systematically. What's left to explain, really? I wrote uh, quite a lot of papers on uh, matty and matter antimatter, um, pair creation and, and radiation. Um, so we have uh, an electron and a positron, well, a positron and an electron here, a proton and an antiproton, and they sort of are supposed to um, 
annihilate uh, each other and uh, produce a very high energy photon. So we have charge that vanishes or it gets um, created out of um, out of photons. That's something I um, I think is poor accounting going on, and I think that's. Um, you know, I don't believe in virtual particles, but I think the discovery of W plus minus and Z bosons, these very massive bosons, uh, so they're photons, supposed to be um, photon-like, you can add them on top of each other. Um, I, I don't think they, they might not be bosons, I think they might have a role to play in that, especially when we talk about proton and anti-proton annihilation. So that's something um, I've left and um, uh, here, how does charge really vanish? Uh, in my worldview, it, it doesn't. I think there can be sloppy accounting, um, you know, these um, large uh, electron um, proton uh, colliders and all that have been wrapped up in 60s, 70s. Well, we have now Large Hadron Colliders, but the electron positron colliders, sorry, LEP. Um, I think these experiments need to be looked at, and um, I'm, I'm really curious to see, um, you know, in five or ten years, uh, China will have uh, these. Um, We'll have, we'll have rebuilt a few of our accelerators. Um, maybe something will come out uh, that sort of uh, proves that charge doesn't vanish. Uh, because why is this important for me? Because I think uh, we have a global charge conservation law, of course, you know, when an electron and a positron uh, annihilate, uh, you know, the net charge uh, is, uh, is still, uh, you know, plus uh, and minus is the zero. Um, but, you know, we have, uh, as I said, my interpretation is local, uh, laws, I would say it, uh, local symmetry laws, local conservation laws, local whatever, and and a realist. Uh, uh, so what I what I mean with that is, uh, in a realist interpretation, you know, if you, if your fundamental ontological um, concepts of your theory uh, are based on charges and fields, that's that's what I believe. You know, we have charges and fields, and fields are from charges, and charges create fields. Then you know, charge charge can't vanish. Um, and I'm really in a minority that also I'm going to talk about the Sitter Institute. You know, there's a lot of people thinking like me with these local and realist interpretations. O on this one, I'm really alone. And um, and it's one of the reasons why a, a lot of people think I'm, I'm a, a little bit nuts, probably. Um, which all depends on your point of view and of where you are uh, on the uh, Gauss curve, I would say, or the normal distribution of, uh, of uh, opinion on certain topics. Um, so that that's something uh, that's left to explain. Uh, I'm not going to work on it. It's going to show over time. I said, uh, you know, experiments get redone. Uh, I'm not into the nitty gritty of the, um, you know, the, these experiments. What came out of them exactly? How does it annihilate? What was measured uh, with calorimeters or were they really photon detectors? What 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 really uh, came out of these? Well, were these, um, you know, to put it plainly, um, were these real gamma? Uh, rays and real photons or did they carry as i suspect a little bit you know a charge which was not oscillating you know a sitter bewegen model is like if you char have your charge uh, point like charge uh, it must be spinning around right but maybe in these wz bosons um you know orbital motion of a charge does get converted to a, a plain uh, linear uh, motion i'm tempted to show some diagrams on that um using uh, uh, Vassalo, which shows if something goes round and round and round, and you add the lateral um, uh, velocity component to it, then the radius of the oscillation must become slower, etc. There are there are geometric models that suggest that maybe the gamma rays that came out of this uh, are, are not normal photons. Consist of well, uh, they carry a field, but um, maybe they also carry charge, but charge in sort of a, a motionless state. As said, this is. Uh, I will put across. Uh, um, don't read me. This is much more non-mainstream than this proton model that I presented just now. Um, the neutron model. Of course, we have protons and electrons now. That's kind of fine. And then, you know, from matter antimatter, we just kind of change the charge, a plus and a minus. Uh, but here, and that's maybe something I want to show. Um, you know, here we have spin in one direction uh, and motion in one direction. Maybe, uh, you know, I added another one here uh, where I have, um, uh, uh, if one is positive uh, point like charge and the other one is negative, so it would mean it would spin around in the other direction. How do I model that? Um, you can see that here at the bottom. Um, 
I have a, a, a minus sign. I could also put a, a minus sign um, for before the, the W uh, factor. And so, um, oh, actually, no, they spin in the same direction. Let me um, draw you one more. Minus. for your patience and I'm adjusting this thing here um, minus and so let me um, because I wanted to show sort of like a symmetric thing I think the minus is here minus 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 you always have reserve have minuses yeah okay so now you have, um, you can clearly see uh, different spin directions. You know what I also did here, and this is something funny you can see, I al also put a minus sign in front of the uh, um, spherical coordinate itself. And so it means actually that these two uh, point-like charges that I fit them, which, which should be opposite, huh? one spit in one direction, the other in one direction, also are in a motion that, uh, you know, at each and every point in time, they're completely opposite to each other and have a maximum distance between them. And so that might be, I'm just saying it might be, uh, you know, the way I imagine a, uh, a neutron, which is also a um, crazy hypothesis. I think a neutron must be uh, some positive and a negative charge that... Um, here, a mass without mass model of protons and neutrons. Um, we just like the Planck-Einstein relationship where, you know, there, there must be positive and negative charge in, uh, and what I model here is like uh, elliptical orbitals, but the, the, the problem here is, uh, yeah, around the center of mass. How do we ensure these two things uh, never collide? Uh, uh, two charges, uh, positive, negative, you don't want to have a model where they can just sit on top of each other, literally. Uh, they have a fermionic nature also. And so that's a, a thing where I also feel my um, uh, 3D model of um, that I have here, uh, you know, these two charges never collide. Uh, they always have a maximum uh, distance between them. Uh, still, they clearly uh, stay together in a sort of um, quantized um, oscillation. And so maybe my neutron model uh, might work, and that's probably why we have, I would say, uh, neutrons uh, uh, that are related to protons and antiprotons. We don't have a, a neutron counterpart with electrons and positrons, and that's uh, probably, uh, I mean, that's, that's a wild hypothesis, of course, uh, is, um, is because, uh, I said, this, this figure is, is, is problematic. Uh, two flat, uh, two D oscillations uh, in elliptical orbitals around each other. Sooner or later, it has to collide. It has a lot of other theoretical problems uh, that are related to it. So for an, uh, an electron and a positron, yeah, we don't have like a, uh, the, the electron, well, electron generation or whatever you want to call it. We don't have an equivalent of the neutron in, uh, you know, that the energy uh, levels uh, of um, of electrons, and I think it's because you know electrons are a two D oscillation, and um, a proton is a three D oscillation. It gives a lot more freedom on how you can combine charges. So um, crazy hypothesis, yes. Again, don't hate me. Um, let me clean up the rest of my uh, sheet again. So that's it, the neutron model. The other thing is um, we have these nuclear reactions um, which involve the strong force or whatever. I, I think they're electromagnetic uh, force, and I write about that, where, um, you know, a, a neutron, you know, it's not stable outside of a nucleus. It disintegrates into a proton. And an electron, as I said, but I said point-like charge inside of an electron is something else. That's also where I wonder. But let's say a neutron uh, disintegrates into a proton and a negative charge. Uh, if it's really an electron, probably, you know, there's some intermediary stage where we have maybe indeed this boson-like thing or whatever. And then it sort of combines into a, a stable uh, electron. A proton, conversely, uh, uh, can uh, 
you can go through um you know that's what Schrodinger the inside nucleus we have maybe this proton neutron for one lung's process where it emits uh, a positron and uh, a neutron stays behind uh, the antimatter counterparts changing each other signs are given here so I, I theorize a lot about that uh, my models are not um, uh, clear I'm just quite pleased to see if I made that one do yeah so here we have these reactions and this is a paper um, I just want to show it because uh, it, it deserves uh, I think um, more than 5,000 views because I, um, I said uh, it's title is on pair production as a nuclear process but it's really about the nature of, of pair production and you know the the hypothesis um, so do we really need um, to assume a strong force maybe it's God it's all electro the, 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 um, electromagnetic uh, dipole field so that's the other paper I want to show here do we really need to nuclear force hypothesis again my thesis is everything is electromagnetic quantum physics is just uh, Maxwell's equations plus uh, the Planck Einstein relation and that's all you need to explain um, what goes on uh, inside a, a nucleus combined with the Planck Einstein relation super subtle um, so again, crazy hypothesis, um, but yeah, I've worked on that. You can read on that. Uh, I think of as a neutrons, uh, some kind of a combination of positive, negative, and negative charge. And that's the other thing. Why do I think that? You know, deuteron. Uh, if you have one proton uh, and some electron going around in it, uh, uh, modeled by Schrödinger's equation, in all kinds of uh, orbitals with uh, different uh, energy levels associated to it. Uh, H times F, two times KHF, E times whatever, hmm? quantized energy states, then, uh, you know, in nature you will see that, um, okay, let's now put um, two protons together. Well, that doesn't work. That that doesn't see. You, ha you will have one proton, a neutron, and another proton. And so I'm thinking like that must have some meaning. And this figure, uh, it reminds you of quarks and gluons, but I don't believe in quarks and gluons. Again, don't read me. I'm uh, not mainstream here, really not mainstream. Um, I would prefer to decipher CPD with fine people that think quark gluons, you know, virtual particles have, uh, are useful. Um, I don't. Um, but so this is something that set me thinking is, um, yeah, we... Um, we can have an electromagnetic deuteron model. I thought a lot about that, um, and it is, where is it? Let me close uh, this one here. Uh, do we need nuclear force? I can close this one, you see I'm wrapping up. Um, we can close this one. Pair production, oh, actually I didn't, I didn't put it up. But there is in my papers somewhere, uh, a couple of papers actually on an electromagnetic deuteron model and it was inspired by someone who contacted me on, on, on a very different matter actually he wanted to discover um, you know electron orbitals inside of a nucleus um, subquantum orbitals uh, that didn't yield anything but I had a good time with this man uh, and it inspired me to Right, let me see here. Um, mm, electromagnetic deuteron model. Well, I'm wasting some time with too many papers. I said I should re uh, revise them, but it helped me a lot to. Um, ah, here we have it electromagnetic deuteron model. Um, have a look at it. Um, it's inspired by a polymath, uh, Dicia, who indeed says, you know, if you think about dipole fields, uh, you apply um, uh, the, the, the Biot-Savart law to it. Biot-Savart, sorry, it is a French. Uh, Biot was not German, I don't know. Um, but then you have extremely strong uh, asymmetric fields, and so that solves actually the problem that um, um, Yukawa wanted to solve by inventing some new force which would be asymmetric acting at short range only but so um, uh, this uh, Dicia, an Italian scientist um, I thought yeah that's that's a great idea if you look at dipole fields um, then they're also asymmetric uh, they're, they're, um, they're for the short range you know their um, potential that is uh, related to them is not an inverse does not follow an inverse um, 
is one over r rule or an inverse square rule for the uh, for the force, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, yeah, dipole fields are um, are great, and if you have charges spinning around uh, two of them, then you will have these dipole fields, and the order of magnitude, um, yeah, are actually what you need. So I um, I already worked a little bit on. Uh, Quantum field theory, the hypothesis, Yukawa, Nodaka, Zener, and Selak. Yeah, we we uh, clearly knew what was needed, um, but uh, you know, inventing another law force. Um, you know, then you also need to go all the way. A force acts on a charge. So, what is this nuclear charge? Huh? We only know electrical charge. So, how are you gonna call it? We're gonna call it uh, an Einstein or a Dirac, uh, you know, the equivalent of a Coulomb. So I worked that out in this paper, and I said basically, you know, logically, semantically, symbolically, um, no. And here I work sort of these dipole fields, where you can see we have what the nuclear force would do or any other force would do. Um, we have local minima, uh, and uh, yeah, non nonlinear or polynomial um, uh, functions for um, fields. Potentials and uh, forces. So um, you can have a look at that. It's, uh, I said, not a solved problem. Um, but yeah, one that uh, maybe you will solve and you'll have some fun with. I mean, it will be some fun. Uh, the other thing that I left is the, the my dark model model. Um, I put it here, uh, an anti-force. Uh, you know, it's not like anti-matter, so I should you find another term. But the thing that struck me is, uh, you know, there's a lot of talk about um, uh, asymmetries uh, in physics. Huh? Uh, C, uh, P, parity and time asymmetry, time doesn't go back. But they uh, they missed the main one, according to me. If you see the magnetic field vector, how it's related, huh? um, we have the Euler's force, huh? uh, Q times um, the electric field vector, one, two, sorry, what is that shot? Um, uh, Q times, sorry. Velocity of the charge and the vector cross parallel to the P magnetic field vector. Now you need to know this magnetic field vector. It lags the electric field vector. Uh, uh, there's a phase difference, but uh, there's not a phase difference actually. In ge geometry, uh, the uh, is such that uh, it, it makes an angle. Uh, um, yeah, it makes an angle uh, which we can represent. Uh, represent by the imaginary unit I, and we have known as a rotation vector, or rotation operation by 90 degrees. Um, well, or you don't know that, that's not how um, uh, your teacher explained it to you, but it's, it amounts to that. Um, so we rotate um, our electric vic vehicle into uh, the magnetic field vector, but it's, um, I is depending on your convention, if you look from the back or the front, I don't need to be really rigorous about that. It's a counterclockwise rotation. Uh, and of course, we also know the uh, the factor C. But if you use natural units, then the magnetic field vector becomes as important as the electric field vector. So don't worry about that. But that's sort of a, an asymmetry, which I thought: what if we, uh, what if there would be a force, uh, uh, and a sort of anti-force, um, so we have minus B, um, where the magnetic field vector would be a, a, a clockwise rotation. Uh, there would be another. Um, yeah, call it an anti-force, another electromagnetic force. Uh, you will say that's crazy as well, it is. Uh, but it's Occam's razor principle. Uh, if you sort of have a mathematical description, which we have here, a physical model uh, described by, by math, then you need to explore, um, it's how Dirac from the positron, eh? he said, you know, you, my equation, wave equation, would, would work perfectly well with, um, with positron, positive electrons as well. So think about these uh, degrees of freedom, I would say, in your in your uh, description, your mathematical description, and uh, and see what would happen if you have a minus sign. You know, we would have um, electromagnetic fields and um, and particles. Our particle models are electromagnetic particles that probably wouldn't interact with each other. So maybe it explains dark matter. Maybe not. Uh, maybe a dark matter is this uh, world in the middle that we think can't exist. You can't walk into the middle, and there's other inconsistencies of about uh, you know when you look at what happens in the middle, especially at the elementary uh, physics level. But maybe that world does exist, um, and maybe it exists in our universe. Uh, it's just a world that doesn't interact uh, with ordinary matter, with ordinary matter, cold matter, and antimatter. 
So um, hypothesis. Um, the other thing is I, I dilated a little bit in, in cosmogenesis. We are not going to pull that up. Publication. But there's, you know, all these um, discoveries that were made that are, um, the universe is actually expanding faster and faster. And that's a surprise because we think uh, the Big Bang here hypothesis, which was, I'm not, I'm not kidding here, uh, endorsed by um, the, the Vatican as sort of a plausible theory compatible with the idea of God. Um, so we think our universe, you know, originated in some Big Bang, so it's, it blew up. Uh, and so it should now, um, because of gravity, you know, that expansion rate should be slowing down. And then maybe um, we can have a model where everything collapses back into, uh, you know, the origin, an oscillating universe or something. Now, there was a Nobel Prize, I think it was 2011 or more recent. It says, well, the, that theory doesn't work because... Um, um, the, the expansion rate of our universe is going faster and faster. So there I have a theory, like, uh, you know, I like theories. Uh, I said maybe there are other universes that, you know, because our universe has a certain age, we can only, uh, uh, you know, capture signals that came uh, from outer space that are uh, about the age of our universe. We look so many billion light years away because so many billion light, uh, light years ago um, our universe blew up and so the signals we get are not older than um, you know the age of our universe but so maybe there are other universes at a third of distances away um, that are as old as our universe uh, but their light or signals just can't reach it and maybe these other universes are pulling our universe apart I realize this is, uh, I talked a lot about, um, you know, nonsensical theories of mine. Uh, this is probably the most nonsensical one, but as I said, it is plausible. It is logical in a sense. It's maybe not plausible, but it's logical. So I'm going to stop my talk here and um, it's really my goodbye. Uh, what I want to do, I'm very pleased um, to see there has, uh, last year there was a, a Citter Institute. Uh, it's a virtual institute. I know it's at sitterinstitute.org. Um, it's a virtual institute, uh, but I'm happy to see it because it, uh, it unites um, a lot of uh, well, researchers like me, I would say, although uh, I said I'm an amateur. It, it, these researchers um, uh, are, are real ones, PhDs and, um, and, uh, and very smart people, um, and they came together and uh, focused on what unites them in terms of uh, indeed arriving at a, a local and, and a realist interpretation of um, of fundamental physics rather than sort of this Copenhagen uh, uh, interpretation, the poor Heisenberg interpretation. It says, oh, we have these probabilities and the only thing we can do is sort of uh, uh, model them in a way that corresponds to uh, the output of our experiment. But uh, no, the probabilities are rooted in something. I said in this Zitter Bewegung, in, uh, you know, it's just the velocities are high. And... Um, so it is possible to uh, build what I call statistically determinist uh, models of, uh, of elementary particles. So um, I would uh, I will refer you there because I will say goodbye to this um, 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 topic of quantum mechanics. Um, if you're dissatisfied, a lot of people are dissatisfied with the local, um, with sort of the Bohr-Heisenberg interpretation, which gets perpetuated endlessly. I'm 55 years old now and you know the books that a Penrose is publishing or a Graham Greene or uh, you know you name it is just they're uh, uh, churning out the same 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 mystery or guru stuff um, uh, all the time and you go like I'm tired of reading these books because I, I don't learn not, um, anything new. So if you want to learn something new uh, then go to this Citer Institute and um, and that will be it. I wish you a, a very, very pleasant day. And I said, I'm signing off. And, uh, whoa, I did uh, talk for um, a full hour. Um, but, yeah, you probably didn't listen to the end anyway. So um, have a nice day. Bye.